not in the same house. He lived in Eisleben only a very short time because his parents moved to Manfield shortly after his birth. But he was, by a quirk of history, was born and died in the same town, but never really lived in that town. Okay. So if you go to Eisleben, you can visit the birth house of Luther and the death house of Luther, where the death mask of Luther is. And the, they did not only a, a face, it was common in those days for important people to make masks of their faces when they died. They also made impression of his hands. And the funny thing is his hands in that are kind of like this. Like he's holding down a piece of paper and getting ready to write. I mean, he wrote so much stuff. All right, major accomplishments of Luther. His focus was on justification by grace through faith. That's the hallmark of the Lutheran church. You want to know, what is it to be a Lutheran? It is to believe that you are justified, made right with God, by grace of God alone, which you receive through faith, which is also not your action. Faith itself is a gift. You remember your catechism? Third article, I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or understanding, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. For the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel. Okay? Faith itself is a gift from God. So we bring nothing to the table. Luther, when he died, had in his pocket a little piece of paper on which it said, we are beggars, it is true. What do you bring after a whole lifetime? What do you bring before God? You bring an empty sack. <laughs> All you bring is the fact that you are baptized, that you are in Jesus Christ. Okay. So justification by grace through faith is the hallmark. Theology of the cross goes with that. Uh, many theologians want to have what we call a theology of glory. We're always looking to, you know, how are we glorified by God? How are we lifted up? And Luther kept saying, no, the only way you're going to know God is to look at Jesus. The only way you're going to understand Jesus is to look at the cross. Because if you take Jesus as a great teacher, a healer, a moralist, a kind person, you know, a tolerant man. I mean, anything you want to say about Jesus, you can say all kinds of wonderful things, but what matters is that he is the one who died and rose again. The cross demonstrates who he is. Mark's Gospel, by the way, is a wonderful example of this. It's 16 chapters long. It covers how much of Jesus' life. Does it have a birth narrative? No birth narrative. It starts with his baptism. It covers three years. And in 10 chapters, 10 to the 16 chapters, it covers those three years. And the last six chapters deal with one week. And the last three chapters deal with three days. So what do you think Mark thought was most important about Jesus? His miracles, his teaching, all those things? What happened at the cross. Okay? So if you want to understand Jesus, you have to look to the cross. This is very Lutheran theology, all right? You have to focus your attention on the cross because there's where the price was paid. There's where our sins were forgiven in and through Jesus' death and resurrection. We also had a strong emphasis on the priesthood of believers. Next week, Pastor Tim is going to talk to you about that and how important that is for vocation, for understanding yourself as a Christian person and the life that you're called to live. He translated the Bible into German. Again, books were were fairly rare, even in, G in uh, Luther's day, but people were beginning to read. By the way, the reason that in cathedrals and all, there's all the stained glass, is that's how they show the stories of faith. Okay? But now people could begin, could begin to read. And so putting the, la the Bible in the language of the people meant that people, the average person, could read the Bible. Now that's rather revolutionary, because before, what was being taught? The priest will tell you what the Bible says. The church will tell you what the Bible says. But we're going to do a dangerous thing, a radical thing here. We're going to give you the Bible and say, what do you think it says? Now, the problem is people have gone off in all kinds of strange directions with that. Okay? But that's why we're called to study Scripture together so we can come to understand what it means. But to have it in your own language means you can read it. If it had not been for Luther doing that, we might still be having Latin Bibles, and chances are we'd read even less of the Bible than we tend to read now. Right? He also would worship the language of the people. Before that, worship was in Latin. Latin all right? So by putting it in the German language, you were a German mass. Uh, and by the way, one of the pieces that changed radically in the German mass was 
and I'll tell you more about this in a few weeks when we talk about the Eucharist. He took out the Eucharistic prayer because it had become so encumbered with things about what we do, our sacrifice, our giving, our doing, and what's, what's it about? God's doing, God's action. And then he wrote lots of hymns. There are a bunch of them in our hymnal. Uh, the most famous of them is? Mighty Fortress is our God, all right? Based on Psalm 46. Uh, some claim that he took, uh, took all, you know, secular music and uh, put good words to it. So what? Okay. If he found a good tune, he used it, he wrote words to it. And if you look at his hymns, they all tell the story of salvation. There are a couple of hymns that are like 26 verses long. And if you sing it from beginning to end, you get the whole story. <laughs> but we don't tend to sing all 26 verses. We probably should some Sunday, just for fun. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Luther's hymns, by the way, how does the mighty fortress go? <coughs> the mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Now, if, you, okay, now if, you finish, if you finish that, that's not how Luther actually wrote it, though. It's in a different meter. A mighty fortress is our God. Which actually is a very strong, strong meter. It's kind of fun. They're both in the hymnal. We ought to sing it both ways. Maybe on Reformation Sunday, that'd be cool to do one to start and one to end. They, they feel different because the music has a different, different beat to it. By the way, of all the hymns, there are many times people learn the first verse of a hymn. If you only learn the first verse of Mighty Fortress, bad, bad, bad. You have to learn the second verse because the first verse ends praising Satan. Okay? He is the one who is powerful in this world. So the second verse tells us that our salvation is in the one that God sent to defeat Satan. So don't ever sing just the first verse. <laughs> Actually, it was kind of funny. When I was doing my doctoral work, uh, it was a San Francisco Theological Seminary, and we had chapel every day, and they were very concerned about uh, gender equality kinds of issues and so on. And so on the... Days commemorating uh, Luther, those of us who were Lutheran, there were two of us in that program, uh, we were asked to kind of take care of chapels, so we did. We sang Lutheran hymns and all, and the Mighty Fortress, well, when it came in, the person who had edited it had looked over it, had changed it, because they didn't want about his kingdom is, you know, and they changed it about Jesus, and it, I, I had to tell her, that's not what the verse is about, it's about the devil. So you know, you got to be careful what you change, because you may <laughs> imply the wrong thing here. Okay. All right. Uh, one other thing I want to get to, just a couple more things. Luther and the Jews. Um, recently, there has been a lot of stuff about Luther and the Jews, and uh, I think we need to put this in, a, in an honest context. Luther said some horrible things. He said some things that, he said things about the Pope, he said things about the Turks, he said things about the Papists, he said things about the Jews, he said things about other reformers that I really could wish he hadn't said. I mean, he, he called them all kinds of horrible names, and they tended to call him the same name as back and forth, but, you know, it, it doesn't feel very gracious for this person who's saved by grace, all right? The, the problem is that he did write a document. He wrote a number of things about the Jews. The first thing is about the Jews. In 1523, he wrote a treatise about that Jesus was born of the Jews. Okay? Very much upholding the whole Jewishness of Jesus and the disciples. And, and so what if they're different than we Christians? We don't live such good lives either. So, hey, Jesus was Jewish. Okay? And... By writing that, he, came, he became kind of the darling of the Jewish community for that period of time because he had actually gone against other theologians in saying that the Jews were to be treated kindly and, and as brothers and sisters. All right? We're talking about a time in history that was incredibly anti-Semitic. Okay? So the Jews had been driven, well, Ferdinand and Isabella, who were they? 1492, they sent Columbus off to discover the new world. They expelled all the Jews from their territory in 1492. Okay. England had expelled the Jews. France had expelled the Jews. Bohemia had expelled the Jews. Spain expelled the Jews. 
because they were seen as being, in some sense, parasitic to society. They had the, whether true or not, they had the kind of sense, and it probably speaks to their, their wisdom, that they tended to get into banking and those kinds of things, and so they would wind up lending money, which is perfectly fair. We function that way now, too, don't we? But they were always accused of usury, of charging way more than was right for the loans that they gave and so on. And so, for all kinds of reasons, different countries expelled the Jews. Okay? Germany had not done that, but a couple of the provinces of Germany did. And it was in this time that Luther wrote this treatise saying, hey, what are we doing? Our Lord himself is Jewish. All right? His mother Mary was Jewish. Well, in the intervening time, there were some other things that were written that began to be seen as, um, well, you know, if you tell a lie long enough, it becomes a truth. Well, so things were written by people about the Jews that they did these horrible things, such as stealing children and using their blood in different ceremonies, uh, desecrating the host in the sacrament, and so on. I mean, these things would be horrible, right? Luther, uh, a man named, what's his name, Antonio... Um, Margaretha was the grandson of a very famous Jewish scholar. He converted to Christianity and then wrote a treatise against the Jews, against his own people, in which he repeated all these kinds of things, these horrible things the Jews do. So Luther wrote a treatise, he wrote a couple of them, but one primarily on the Jews. Now, why don't you look back here. Luther's works have been... Uh, Gathered yeah, together. They begin right here with this first red book and they go to that red book down there. Okay? I need, could you grab me that one that's right on this side of the divide, right there, number 47. <coughs> right there. This is Luther's stuff on the Jews. Okay? Look at all the other stuff.